Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, you don't see me right now, but I will walk into the camera here shortly. I want to say thank you for uh, putting up with the technological difficulties that we've been experiencing in this last week. It uh, has been frustrating to us and I know frustrating to you guys, but uh, thank you for being patient with us as we continue to work through the technical issues. Um, it is not lost on me that for some of these messages, we are having technical difficulty and I believe uh, you know, Satan's at work in the details, whether it's technical or spiritual. So uh, keep us in prayer as we uh, work through some of these things. And with that, I think it's likely appropriate, not just likely, it is appropriate that we should open this with prayer. So please uh, bow your head and close your eyes and we will start with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and this opportunity that we can gather together. Lord, I pray that uh, you would set me aside and that you would put your word front and center. Lord, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would continue to work and move in the lives of uh, the men who have decided to engage and join us in the study. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in uh, the lives of both myself and Dave. Lord, I pray that uh, we would all be men who choose to stand in the gap to uh, fill that void, to uh, move when called. Lord, uh, so if there is a man out there that's sitting on the sideline, I pray that uh, you would use this as an opportunity to call them into service, Lord, that they might uh, stand before you confident uh, and ready to receive a reward rather than uh, standing before you at the judgment seat of Christ naked and ashamed, Lord. And if there be anyone who does not even have a personal relationship with you, your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that uh, this would be the day, the time, the now, uh, that they would make the decision to uh, come into a relationship with you, that they might be reconciled, Lord. And these things I pray in your son's name. Amen. Well, so welcome uh, again. And uh, on behalf of Dave and myself, I, I want to say thank you for joining us with our men's study. Uh, these are uh, great studies, and I think that you'll find this one is uh, somewhat more evangelistically focused than maybe some of our um, studies in the past, uh, particularly this first lesson. So this first lesson is titled, The Man's Will. Now the author begins by saying this, The mind is the citadel of man's life, and from this powerful engine, our wills determine where we are driven. Now what he is simply saying here is that where you submit your will is where your life is determined to go, where you are actually driven. It's uh, kind of like uh, you have a destination point, but you don't get to that destination point unless you have a map to get there. So in terms of that, uh, our eternal destination is driven by our personal will. And this means that if our will is submitted to the Lord and it's uh, guided by the Lord, then we will end up where He intends for us to be driven, for us to land, to end. Whereas, uh, you know, the not so great option is that we should uh, be self-determinative with our own will and we end up in a ditch somewhere or not quite in the place that God would have determined for our life to be. So with that, uh, I think we can introduce this lesson by saying this, by nature we are at odds with our Creator. We all start off um, being rebellious sinners, uh, lost and disconnected from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, even as Adam proved, and we are prone to rebel against a loving God. The only road to becoming a man of God is the path of the surrendered will from which we can make right choices. Because here's the thing, uh, if our will is surrendered to anything but Christ, we will likely make the wrong choices. We might make good moral decisions, but that doesn't necessarily make it a right choice. So even the decisions that seem small and unimportant will impact our lives. Going a certain route to our job may keep us from getting bogged down in traffic, or perhaps it helps us avoid a traffic accident down the road. However, the point is that every decision we make affects not just our physical life, but our lives spiritually. So we're going to take a look at a few um, a few Bible examples, because the Bible is filled with challenges to God's people to choose wisely. So our first example is Joshua, who called out the people of Israel in Joshua 24, 14 through 16. Now, Joshua 24, 14, 16 records this. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. 
But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. So here we observe Joshua challenging the children of Israel. They know where they've come from. They remember that God got them out of their precarious position in Egypt. And he's reminding them of where they are now. And the problem is, is that they've allowed the gods of Egypt either to move with them or the gods of the Amorites where they presently live to be among them. And yet God never intended for that to come between them and their relationship with God. So they have a choice to make whether they will continue to serve the old gods or to, ser to serve the God. Uh, the next example we see is, uh, you know, Elijah on Mount Carmel. He's crying out to God's people. And, and if you'll turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, we'll read this. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. So here we see a second group of people. They're being... Um, confronted directly by Elijah, uh, and their response is to just simply be silent. I think that this is representative of much of our society today when they are confronted by something that they're not sure about, or maybe they are sure about, but uh, they are, are wary of the repercussions should they take a stand for the right, they remain silent. So calls to make spiritual choices were made to individuals as well as groups. So, for instance, the Lord challenged Peter and Andrew, two individuals, in Matthew 4, chapter, or chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, we read this. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, called two brethren, Simon called Peter, Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and, and followed him. So here we see a third example and a final response. So in the first example, we see that uh, Joshua is challenging the men and women of Israel, and he's calling them back to a relationship with God, that, because simply either it was convenient to serve the gods of the Amorites, or they uh, loved the gods of Egypt more. And in the second example, you see where people just remain silent. But in this third example, you see two men who drop everything that they're doing, and in an instant, make the decision to follow. It says, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. So there are many other illustrations that could be presented here. But the fact is, is that in each case, people were faced with the grave responsibility to choose. And here's the thing. Right choices are not always easy, nor are they immediately profitable. In many cases, right choices are typically the harder choice. So in the army, we have an expression, choose the hard right over the easy wrong. And though it may not be immediately profitable, in the long run, it will be profitable. So every wise decision reaps blessings and benefits from a sovereign and omnipotent God. Uh, if I may, let me share a bit about my personal life uh, regarding decisions, right? As I look back through my own past, there have been uh, minor, major choices in my life that have caused me either to move ahead or to get mired down and go backward. I can remember very vividly when the Lord called me to surrender my life to His will and to go into ministry. I was confident and secure in my career as a military officer. And everything about staying where I was was comfortable because, let's face it, I had a guaranteed career path with guaranteed promotions and a guaranteed retirement. In other words, there were no risks involved in staying military. There comes a moment in every man's life when you have to make a decision to pursue God's calls in your life. The question is this, how do you respond to that call? Do you pursue, pursue security, peace, and happiness? Or do you trust God in spite of uncertainty? So choosing to pursue God's call to ministry was a major choice for both Hillary and I. Because while I was making this choice, it was in a foreign country. We were living in Italy at the time, and we didn't know where I would work or where I would go to school, where we would live or where we would minister. Essentially, you could look at the situation and say that nothing at all was certain and that the only thing that we were able to do in that moment was to depend on God. And 
quite honestly, maybe that's the best place that we could have ever been to be completely dependent on God. So to many people, the obvious or common sense choice was to continue with military service, to stay on to active duty, because their, their thought is, why would you want to jeopardize the security of your career, especially with 10 years served or you're halfway to a military retirement? So Hillary and I, you know, it's a hard choice. What would we do? Well, we pr prayerfully petitioned God concerning the choice and asked him for a clear open or shut door concerning my career. Uh, this was our Gideon moment where we were throwing the fleece out and looking for whether God would uh, respond with a wet fleece or a dry fleece. The goal was to prove God's call to ministry. Now, when I say that I wanted to prove God's call to ministry, this is really what I mean. I mean that I wanted to make sure that God was calling Hillary and I into full-time ministry and that Josh Keats was not calling Hillary and Josh Keats into full-time ministry. That would have been an error. The answer did come very clearly and very loudly. My battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Patrick Wilkins, he was doing battlefield circulation while we were training in Germany. And as things go, he... Uh, asked me, you know, Josh, what, what are your future plans? Because, you know, co battalion commanders ask company commanders what their future plans are because if they have good company commanders, they want to prepare the way for them to be uh, successful in their careers. In response, I told Colonel Wilkins that my plan was to finish my time on active duty and to pursue a seminary education and that I would be uh, going into full-time ministry with the hopes of returning to active duty as a chaplain someday. Colonel Wilkins sat back and thought about that for a moment, and his response was this. That sounds great, Josh, but I am not interested in developing company commanders into being future chaplains. Rather, my job is to prepare company commanders to be future battalion commanders. Now, that was a hard response for me to hear. And not only was the verbal response hard to hear, but what happened a week later was even more difficult. So I found myself and, uh, and my first sergeant and I found ourselves out of a job as company commander and first sergeant. But despite my disappointment, I did find comfort in God's confirmation to pursue ministry through this action. Even if we did not know where we would live, and even if my job at the time was up in the air, even if we didn't know where we would work or minister or go to school, it was clear that the path the Lord called us to was being opened up. So I'm reminded of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which says this, uh, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now the interesting part about that passage is that it talks about the path, but it never discusses the destination. It, just the requirement to trust the Lord, and he will direct your path. So the path the Lord calls you to may not be easy, but down the road, if you've been obedient, you will look back and say, I am so glad that I chose this path. And part of that is because the path is so much simpler when the Lord is directing it. So here's another illustration I'd like to share with you. Hopefully you've all have heard of the missionary David Livingstone. So this story is told of a missionary society that contacted the missionary David Livingstone, who is serving in the heart of Africa. They wrote, Dear Dr. Livingstone, have you found a good road to where you are? If so, then we want to know how to send other men to join you. Now, Dr. Livingstone's response uh, may have shocked them. He replied saying, If you have men who will come only if they know there is a good and easy road to follow, I don't want them. I want men who will come even if there is no road at all. So here's the point, right? He wants men of faith who would follow when God calls despite the fact that there is a road or no road. Uh, he understood that God would make the path for them, that if uh, he had called them to the ministry in Africa, they would find a way. It seems in this day, we often choose the road that looks good and is easy for us to tread. We're looking for a three-way high, highway with 70 mile an hour speed limits so that things move smoothly and quickly. But the fact is the Lord calls and sometimes his directions are diametrically opposed to our plans, or they are in direct contradiction of what we have planned. Today, we find that the Christian ranks of men are often filled with weak-willed men who faint, 
and fail to follow the Lord's directions. It appears that the closer we come to the Lord's appearing, that not only are men weak-willed, but worse. They are absent or just missing entirely. The men, men are needed who will blaze a trail while following our guide, Jesus Christ. So we'll look at another example. We'll look at the prophet Ezekiel. So Ezekiel sent out probably the most profound call of his day to the men, uh, to the to the men of Israel, and uh, they had turned away from the Lord. Let's look at their response. So the prophet Ezekiel sent out his most profound call to the men of his day, who who had turned away from the Lord when he said in Ezekiel twenty two thirty. And uh, here's what it says. And, and I sought for a man, and notice the, the language, a man, singular, among them, plural, that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. This is an extremely tragic statement that with so many men, plural, who could have stepped up to stand in the gap and make up the hedge, not just most men were not willing to make the choice that, that would have spared the nation of Israel from God's judgment, but no man would stand in that gap. So our choice must be to follow the directives of God, to stand in the gap, to make up the hedges, so that our lives and those for whom we are accountable might be spared from certain disaster. With today's hectic schedules and the many directions our lives are being pull, pushed, we must be willing to choose the Lord's path rather than our own. So what we're going to look at next is uh, our key passage. It's going to be 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1-3. through 3. And really this is David addressing his son Solomon. He yearns for Solomon to follow his own commitment to the Lord. So we're going to see three practical steps to follow if you and I are going to show ourselves as men as God. And here's the first point. Point one. Make a decision to follow Christ. Simply this, you have to have a relationship with Christ before anything else follows. So let's take a look at, at our key passage. We're going to look at the first two verses. 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, which say, Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. So if you're following along with me on your, your um, handout, our first, really our second um, thing to, to record is to be ready. So David is calling his son Solomon to be ready. He says this, I go the way of all the earth. Solomon was reminded of the certainty of death, that no one is exempt. Uh, we all know that our lives can end at any moment. Now, James makes this even more apparent in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, saying, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and go, and buy and sell, and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So what the, the author is saying in that verse is simply this, like people are going around talking about their grand plans. They're talking about, I'm going to go to this city and make this uh, investment and choice and I will get this reward. And they're talking two, three, four years down the road. And the author is reminding them that at any moment, your life is like a vapor. vapor. You can be done just like that. He's reminding them that what they should say is that if the Lord wills, if we should continue to live and do this or that, you know, maybe we'll be prosperous. But he's reminding you that it could end at any moment. So here's the thing. We must not assume that we will live long lives, but we must be ready to meet God, our maker, at any moment. Let's look at what Hebrews 9.27 says to illustrate this point even more. It says this, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So not only do we have the certainty of death, but we also have the certainty of a judgment. Now judgment is going to come in two forms. As a lost man, it will come as a judgment for your life and the fact that you rejected God. And it will end with uh, punishment. For the saved, 
the judgment isn't about your eternal destination. It's about your eternal obedience, whether or not you followed after the Lord and were obedient to his commands while you lived, whether you left a legacy moving into the future or not. So let me ask you a very serious question. If you were to stand before the living God in the next few moments, would you be ready? Are you now ready to give an answer for your life? Are you ready to give an account for all the opportunities in ministry that you either lost or failed to take advantage of? Would you stand before God ashamed or expectant of a reward? Would you even stand before God in the judgment seat of Christ? Or would you be standing for, before God for judgment uh, and punishment for your sin? The great tragedy is this. It's when men who know about Jesus Christ were never truly saved according to the Bible. So they have a knowledge of who Christ is, but they don't have a knowledge of salvation according to the Bible. So Jesus makes this sad statement in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, saying, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say it to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have, have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now imagine this scenario, right? You've got people who are approaching Jesus with familiarity, saying, Lord, Lord, making a petition. And they're talking about all of the things that they have done in the name of Jesus. And the Lord doesn't deny that they have done those things because there is power in the name of Jesus. We know that the name of Jesus affects even the casting out of demons. We know that it's recorded in the Bible. But you can do something utilizing the power of the name of Jesus and still not have a relationship with the owner of the name. The difference is, is that uh, what Jesus emphasized here is the but, the contrast. So many shall enter... Uh, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. And the contrasting statement is this, or the but, those who do enter. He, here's the criteria. He that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So I ask you again, are you absolutely sure that you are ready if death were to come today? So being prepared for eternity is more than just having a good religion or giving to a great Christian cause or serving in some capacity as a volunteer or doing meritorious works. The fact is there is nothing that you can do to be sure that you're going to heaven except to understand how helpless you are and how hopeless your condition is, uh, condition as a sinner is. Romans 3.23 tells us this, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And maybe this is the first time you're coming face to face with your own mortality. Maybe you are now asking yourself, am I? Am I really ready if I died today? Maybe because you are uncertain, you want to know what does the Bible have to say about being prepared for eternity? Being prepared for eternity means that you recognize that you are a sinner in need of a savior, who is a person who is incapable of doing anything to save yourself. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us this, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by any works, not of works, lest any man should boast. The fact is, is if we could earn or work our way into God's good graces, what that verse tells us, that one, it's absent of the grace and faith required, but two, it would put us in a position to boast before God, to steal God's own glory. And what a shame that is. Uh, we would basically stand and declare exactly what Satan is trying to declare, that he is like the Most High God, or even above the Most High God. You must accept the responsibility for your sin, the sin that put Jesus on the cross, and then you must ask for forgiveness for that sin. You must trust that the blood of Jesus shed on the cross covers your sin and accept Christ as your Savior. Your sins, having been forgiven through the blood of Jesus, shed on the cross is what saves you. The Bible says this in John 1, 12, But as many as have received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I mean, what an incredible statement here. 
He gives us the power to become the sons of God. If only, if only we believe on his name. And the Apostle Paul says, said it this way in Acts 20, verse 21, saying, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So if there is any doubt regarding your eternal destiny, look to Christ right now and pray this simple prayer with real faith. Remember, it's not the words, but the humble attitude of prayer that brings salvation. So pray with me. Dear God, I come to you right now a helpless, hell-bound sinner. I recognize my sin against you, and I understand that I deserve your wrath for my sin. I recognize my helpless and hopeless con condition, understanding that there is no good thing that I can do to earn your good graces through my own personal efforts. I ask for your full forgiveness. Lord Jesus, I am right now trusting in your sacrifice for me on the cross as you shed your blood, paying for my sin, and rose again from the dead. I now receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me today. Amen. Now, maybe you're still on the fence concerning your readiness to face death in eternity. I don't know. But let me encourage you, don't put this decision off. As Paul admonishes in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, he says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In other words, there's no time like the present because now is, it is. You, you don't have any fear in the moment. You don't know what's about to come, though. You don't know what the next 10, 20 seconds might hold, the next hour, the next day. So moving on, to those who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, men who are born again, you must be willing to follow Christ and to submit your will to walk in obedience before Him. Let's look at our next major point. It says this, be strong, or what David tells Solomon is, be thou strong. Many men will choose to devote themselves to some physical routine or bodybuilding program. I personally like CrossFit, and of course, you can joke about this, but the first rule of CrossFit is you have to talk about CrossFit, so I'm talking about CrossFit. But the strength that Christian needs is a spiritual strength, not a physical strength, and that strength will come from the Lord. A man may be physically strong, but, but spiritually frail. Um, we are challenged continually through the Bible to be strong spiritually. Let's look at what Paul says in Ephesians 6.10. He says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, and in the power of His might, not in the power of our own might, but in the power of His might. And 2 Timothy 2.1 says this, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Next, we see that Paul compares developing physical strength to pursuing spiritual strength in 1 Timothy 4.8, where he says this, For bodily exercise profiteth little for a time, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise uh, having promise of the life that now is and of the that which is to come <laughs> so what we see here is a, a comparison and a contrast between uh, physical strength and spiritual strength and what we see is that the physical strength is uh, profitable a little bit for a short time but godliness is profitable for not just physical strength, but for all things, number one. Plus, look at the scope of time. It's not limited for a time, a short time. It is, um, it is profitable for the promise of the life that is now, like your present life. And then it moves into eternity and says, and of that which is to come. So you can see now why the exercise of the spiritual is so much more important than the exercise of the physical. Now, I'm not telling you to ignore the care of your health because, well, I'm sure that you want to be around and strong and physically capable for your family for as long as possible, and that's a good thing. But in terms of the spiritual disciplines, you're preparing now for eternity, so you do need to be about those things. So choose to pursue spiritual strength as you exercise yourself in prayer, Bible reading, Bible study, and daily godly living. I would also encourage you to get involved in things like Harvest Teams or Discipleship, where you get an opportunity to, uh, specifically through Harvest Teams, you grow in your evangelistic efforts and understanding how to do the applicable 
the daily application of ministry runs on the rails of relationships. You're intentional in your relationships so that you can have intentional conversations that lead to the intentional gospel message that hopefully leads to intentional salvation. Uh, discipleship, on the other hand, allows you to have the basic fundamental building blocks to understand the Bible so that you can be an effective minister and effectively live out the daily principles the Bible teaches us in our lives. Here's the third uh, thing that, that David tells Solomon. He says this, be a man, but he says it in a different way. He says this in 1 Kings 2, 2, show thyself a man, um, demonstrate it, show it, put it on display. Today's society views real men as aggressive and muscular in appearance, uh, you know, or they're running around with guns. Uh, yeah, so they're usually displayed as macho in appearance, but what God sees is that real men are quite different. Let's look at how Micah 6.8 describes a real man. So a real man is one that... Uh, is, is expressed this way. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. So there are three instructions that we're going to see here concerning what is good and what God requires. The first thing is to do justly, to do what is just. In other words, this is justice from God's perspective, not man's perspective. And what this really requires is not a political position on justice or social justice. This requires a, the Bible says, focus in order to understand what real justice from God's point of view is. This is why it's so important for us to understand God's commands, His statutes, His judgments, His testimonies. Um, the next thing is to love mercy. And the reason why mercy is so important is because it took a great deal of mercy for God to forgive us. Uh, I like to think of it this way. In light of all that God has forgiven me, past, present, and future, in terms of my sin, uh, how can I not be merciful to others? How can I not extend the same forgiveness to others when, uh, in light of the vastness of my debt, that I should hold some small, tiny debt of sin against another person? One, it's not mine to hold against them. And two, because of what God forgave me, by extension, I should also be forgiving and allow God to take care of the rest. That is what it means to, to be merciful, but not just be merciful, but to love mercy. Three, to walk humbly with thy God. Now, the first two don't happen unless you are walking humbly with God. Now, the way I illustrate that is this. Uh, if you do not have a proper upreach with God, then you're not going to have a proper outreach with people. If you don't walk humbly with God, then you will not be loving and just towards people outwardly. Godly Christian men need God's strength of character and a humble spirit so that the world can see that they are different from it. Here's our no next major point for study. It's this. Make a dedication to God's Word or dedicate you to studying God's Word. 1 Kings 2.3 says this, And keep the charge... And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes and His commandments and His judgments and His testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. So now we see that David is charging Solomon to keep the charge. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God. So Solomon is to obey the charge by doing all that God has commanded. Any man who has served in our country's military service knows full well that when a command is given by his commanding officer, the immediate response is to be, yes, sir, or aye, aye, sir. I think that's how the Navy says it. Why is it then that so many men who would immediately obey the command of an earthly authority would so quickly disobey the command of our heavenly authority. The fact is this, we must obey promptly. 1 Samuel 3.10 tells us this, And the Lord came and stood and called as, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Now if you remember, Samuel had a few times before been in front of Eli trying to figure out what, what Eli was calling him for, not recognizing that it was God calling but once he recognized that it was the voice of the Lord, he immediately obeyed. 
So the Lord calls us to follow him in obedience. But the first thing is, do we actually listen? And then if we're listening, do we obey as Samuel did? So next, we see that David charges his son to walk in his ways, not in David's ways, but in the ways of God. It has often been rightfully said that the will of God will not lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. So we often fear that following God's way will lead us to something that we will not enjoy or something that we cannot handle. But here's the thing. The God who directs you in His way knows all about you and will only lead you in ways that are for your eventual good. God's trying to make you look more like His Son, Jesus Christ, not more like the world. He's not trying to tear you down and destroy you. No, He's trying to transform you like Romans 12, 2 says. So being obedient brings us to comprehend that the truth uh, brings us to comprehend that truth and does not lead us to dead end paths. Like I said about Proverbs three, five, and six, right? It doesn't mention the destination; it mentions his leading. So here's the next thing: David tells Solomon to keep his word. Keep God's word, and he says it this way in Second in First Kings chapter two verse three: to keep His statutes, and His commandments, and His judgments, and His testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses. So not just what to keep, but how to keep it specifically, as it is written in the law of Moses, so that it doesn't get messed up. You may say that trying to obey all these things is very difficult, and I would agree that it's impossible. Uh, especially if we're trying to do it in our flesh and cutting the Holy Spirit out because it can become a matter of checking the box, uh, a fleshly task. Yet Christ, Jesus Christ reminds us this in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we yield our own will to Him, keeping His word becomes our joy, and obedience brings us peace. Let's take a quick look at Psalm 119, 165. It says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And in our society today, this is an incredible statement. And the reason why this is an incredible statement is because most people are offended all the time. But this says you will have good peace or great peace uh, based on the love of God's law and nothing shall offend them. So, I mean, if you find yourself offended, maybe it's because there's a disconnection from yourself and God's word. Find out why it is that you're being offended and submit it to the Lord. Put that off and put on its biblical replacement. The next thing that Solomon is instructed from his father is this. Uh, this is kind of like the A plus C, A plus B plus C equals D sort of formula. If you do these things, then you'll experience the results, right? You'll, you'll have a great outcome. And what we see in 1 Kings 2, 3 is that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. What we see is that blessings can only follow when we make choices that submit to the Lord's authority. The word success is only found in the Bible one time. We see this found in Joshua 1.8, which says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to the, all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now, I'd like to share with you a few observations that we might take away from this passage. Let's look at two practical steps for becoming intimately familiar with God's Word through two instructions. When we look at the passage, we see what God's Word actually does. So God's Word does not depart out of your mouth. That doesn't mean you don't ever say the Word of God or you don't share the, the Word of God. No, what it really means is that God's Word remains present within your mouth. It's always present on your tongue. It's always something that is being molded or talked about, chewed on, if you will. Uh, but that requires some speaking of the Word. Two, you must meditate 
or critically think about it. You ask and answer questions about it. You ponder it. You internalize it. You synthesize it. You make it part of you. It becomes part of your thinking. And you don't just do this occasionally. You do it day and night. This means that it is always present in your thinking. Now, in our society, that's a hard thing to do because we are so easily distracted by whatever the next great sporting event is, whatever uh, concert happens to be on, whatever activity we've got going on. We're so interrupted in our daily lives and daily thinking that nothing stays present in our mind 24-7, especially not biblical principle or God's Word. How much different would our lives be if we meditated in this way day and night? So then we move from the Word to the methodology for practically applying God's Word, right? So you have to intimately know the Word before you can actually apply the Word. Uh, so that's what this verse is demonstrating. So in order to practically apply God's Word to daily living, you have to do two things. Observe is the first thing that the, the passage tells us. It says, observe to do according to all that is written therein. So we identify what the text commands or instructs, and then the second part is, then we do all, not just part, not your favorite parts, all that is written, or in simple terms, we apply it in, the, in uh, our daily living. So the, the end result is this. It's an A plus B equals C formula. When you know God's Word and you apply God's Word in daily living, then you can expect a certain result. Now the results look like this. It says then two times in this passage. The verse says, For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Right? Your, your way or your lifestyle will become prosperous. And then the second then says this, And then thou shalt have good success. And when you have success in God's terms, according to this passage, they come hand in hand. It's not an, an or phrase. It's an and phrase. So one type of prosperity is tied to the other. So you will become prosperous in your lifestyle and you will have good success according to God's standard, not the world's. Now, uh, I believe that good success equals anything that as an outcome brings glory and honor to God. Now that may differ from your uh, definition of success, but we're on God's economy, not the world's economy. So no matter where we look for blessing and success, we will find them only by following God's Word. Here's our third and final point for, this, for study. This one's pretty heavy, but here's point three. Devotion to a godly legacy. Let me ask you a thought-provoking question. What will you leave behind when you leave this world? Or what will your legacy be? Many men will leave a substantial amount of material wealth, like money or property, but they will leave no great spiritual legacy. In fact, the legacy of most men does not even make it beyond the memory of their own families, or in the extraordinary cases, beyond the memory of history books. Solomon's legacy depended on his following the Word of God. What will you leave behind to your family and to others that you have influenced? Will your legacy extend it into eternity, or will it end the day you die? What we see here is that David had established a great legacy for Solomon to inherit. He had transferred the leadership of a nation from the house of Saul and established the royal house of David. One day, its majesty will be seen when Jesus Christ, the son of David, sits on his throne to rule the entire earth. So not only did David sort of transformed the royal line of Israel. He transformed it so much so that the Son of God is part of his physical heritage. Uh, that's a pretty incredible legacy because the uh, eternal legacy tied to that is incalculable. So David's greatest legacy is found in Acts 12 th or 13:22. We read this. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So what we see here is that it was God's judgment, God's words that made the declaration that, God, that David was a man after God's own heart. 
That's an incredible statement. And he doesn't just stop, stop there. And he says that he will fulfill or shall fulfill all my will. So he was a man after God's own heart and he was obedient. So the choices we make in life and the decisions we follow, they will come from our own will, yes. But is your will submitted to God's that it, your own will might resemble God's will? Will you show yourself a man who is following after the living God? So I want to conclude this way. The fact is that before you can leave a legacy, you have to have a legacy to leave. What do I mean by that? Well, we don't really have an eternal legacy to leave. We, we, we don't have a way to lead relationships into eternity unless this first thing must, is in place, right? Do you have a relationship with Christ? Have you made a decision to follow Christ? Without that, there is no legacy. Two, are you dedicated to God's Word? Have you made it so a part of you that you are able to function in a way that brings glory and honor to God, that allows you to be successful on God's terms? And finally, does your legacy end at death or does it live into eternity? Well, I want to thank you guys for joining me today, and I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, as I said before. I'm going to close in prayer. We'll get this uploaded for you shortly, and we look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and this time. Thank you for um, allowing me to speak this word. Lord, I pray that uh, there are hope in hearts and minds ready to receive it. Lord, if there is any person out there who does not have a personal relationship with your son, Jesus Christ, who is not prepared to stand before your son, who does not know what their legacy would be, I pray that uh, you would continue to use the word to work in them and use the spirit to draw them. But ultimately, Lord, I pray that they would uh, reach out to one of us, to myself or Dave, in order to get an answer to see what the Bible says about knowing Christ personally, personally and about how to leave a legacy. Lord, I pray that you would continue to be glorified through uh, our efforts and that uh, your name be magnified through Blue Springs and through the earth. And these things I pray in your son's name. Amen. Again, thanks for joining me, guys. And uh, I'm going to walk around here. We will see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Have a good day.